In 1789, the Italian Luigi Galvani noticed something very strange. Years earlier, he had discovered that a dead frog's leg could be made to twitch when it came into contact with an electric spark, and he had his theories around why this happened, remembering this was well before many people knew how electricity worked. But he now noticed something completely unexpected that he could not explain. He was generating an electrical spark, and nearby was sitting a dead frog with a scalpel resting on its leg. And he discovered that every time he generated a spark nearby, the frog's leg would twitch. And this didn't make any sense. There was nothing that was sending an electrical current to the frog, and yet there it was. The frog's leg was twitching. He then noticed the same twitching would happen when there was a lightning strike nearby. What on earth was going on? Well, let's find out, and believe it or not, starting with dead frogs mysteriously twitching is going to take us through a process that leads us to the absolutely game-changing invention of the wireless radio. Now we're going to jump forward almost a hundred years from Galvani's twitching frogs to an inventor called David Edward Hughes in London in 1879, who also stumbled on something he couldn't explain. He was working on one of his experiments and he noticed that when he initiated an electrical current, he was somehow causing a bad contact on a bell telephone nearby to spark. After further study and modifications, he discovered that he could carry his telephone device almost 500 meters out into the street and still generate the same result. He took this incredible discovery to the science authorities of the day of the Royal Society and they told him that this was nothing new. While it may seem that somehow electricity was being transferred through the air, which would have been a remarkable discovery, that it could all be explained by current theories around something called electromagnetic induction. Not being a physicist himself, Hughes took them at their word and did not explore further. Big mistake. You see, Hughes was right in the middle of a period where there was a flood of people trying to crack the invention of what they called wireless telegraphy. Phone and telegraph communication was bound by the cables the signal had to travel along, and theories abounded on possible ways to break free of this limitation. Turns out Hughes had accidentally figured it out, and then upon receiving some historically bad advice, just moved on. And it turns out the answer was actually already out there for anybody to find. Only it only existed in theoretical form. Because in 1873, six years before Hughes's accidental discovery, in the very same city of London, James Clerk Maxwell published his textbook A Treatise on Electricity and Magnetism, the result of years of work in previous papers, which predicted the existence of something called electromagnetic waves. Unfortunately, we don't have time to pause here and talk at length about just how huge and revolutionary Maxwell's work was, but we will quote Nobel Prize winning theoretical physicist Richard Feynman, who said there can be little doubt that the most significant event of the 19th century will be judged as Maxwell's discovery of the laws of electromagnetism. No one had yet experimentally proven Maxwell's work, except Hughes dismissed discovery in 1879, until German physicist Heinrich Rudolf Hertz in 1887. And to explain just how he did it, we're going to need to talk about Maxwell's electromagnetic waves. And to do that, we're going to speed through a few concepts we've talked about in previous episodes about the telegraph and the telephone. We've learned that an electrical current creates something called an electrical field, a region of non-contact force that will push or pull on charged particles that enter its range. We've also learned that this same electrical current also generates a magnetic field, a region of non-contact force that will push or pull on particles that have a magnetic polarity, most noticeably in materials made from magnetic elements. So we know that both electricity and magnetism can interact in ways that do not require contact. But none of this explains what Hughes and Galvani had observed, as these interactions happened well beyond the reach of the known fields. When you reflect on Hughes and Galvani's mysterious observations, you'll notice it was a moment of a burst of current that then generated an electrical interaction nearby. So instead of a steady flow of current, when the current suddenly varied, something new happened that transferred some form of energy through the air. And here's where we get to talk about waves. Have you ever come across a perfectly still pond? The surface is as smooth as glass, not a ripple or imperfection pristine peace and calm. 
There may even be some birds gently singing in the trees. Then you destroy it by throwing a huge rock into the middle of it. And what you'll notice after the rock hits is that ripples will radiate out from the point of impact. What these ripples are is a perfect illustration of waves. In its original state, the water in the pond was in a stable state. No variations in the forces acting upon it, and so the surface was still. But the rock's impact created a huge change in the forces acting on the water, which in turn created waves that travelled outwards from that point, carrying energy outwards, and the size of the waves correlated to the nature of the impact. A small rock thrown in creates smaller waves. A big rock thrown in will create big waves. But if we slowly lower the same big rock into the water, it will create far less variation in the forces acting on the water over time, so we get smaller waves again. This is very, very similar to what happens with electricity and magnetism. A stable direct current will create a stable electromagnetic field, the electric and magnetic fields we discussed earlier. And you could think of that stable electromagnetic field as the still pond. But what happens when that current suddenly changes, just like the rock entering the pond? Well, should the current suddenly stop, or increase, or decrease, or change direction, we suddenly get changes in the electric and magnetic fields created. And these changes create ripples that travel through free space called electromagnetic waves. And these waves, like ripples, carry energy. So what we know about electromagnetic fields is that they cause movement in electrons. And this is also the case with electromagnetic waves. So when Hughes initiated a current, he created a change in an electromagnetic field, which created an electromagnetic wave that when it hit a suitable receiver, caused a movement of electrons that generated a spark. And this is what was happening with Galvani's frogs twitching during storms too. It turns out that lightning is an enormous electromagnetic wave generator, and this is the foundational idea upon which the radio was built. So just how did Heinrich Rudolf Hertz prove the existence of these electromagnetic waves in 1887 and set us on the path to the radio? Well, that's going to have to wait until next episode, where we'll break down the process Hertz created to reliably generate these waves, and we'll discuss the men who built upon his work to help create the modern world of almost constant wireless communication we now live in. Music